Good morning, everyone. This remote meeting of the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee is called to order, and we will begin by taking the roll. Representative Long? Present. Representative Acom? Present. Representative Swazinski? Present. Representative Bo? Present. Representative Bierman? Present. Representative Christensen? Present. Representative Franzen? Present. Representative Hollins? Present. Representative Hornstein? Present. Representative Grunhagen? Present. Representative Igo? Present. Representative Lee? Representative uh, Lislagard? Present. Representative Lippert? Present. Representative Meckland? Present. Representative Munson? Present. Representative Stevenson? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Molzan. Uh, good morning, members. This is our, our last hearing before break. Uh, we have uh, four bills up today, but before we get to the bills, I just wanted to walk through our schedule for uh, when we return from break. We just uh, received that uh, from leadership. So we are going to be having our, um, our first uh, walkthrough meeting on Tuesday, April 6th, when we get back at our normal time from 10.30 a.m. to noon. Uh, we'll be uh, posting the bill um, at least on that Monday, day before. Um, and uh, then we will be uh, taking uh, public testimony on uh, Wednesday, the 7th, 10.30 uh, a.m. to noon. Uh, if uh, we get through public testimony, we'll move on to amendments that day. And then uh, we'll continue with amendments on Thursday from 10.30 a.m. to noon. And we have uh, time held on Friday if we need additional time for amendments. Uh, and that time held is 8.30 a.m. to noon. So um, that's our, our schedule for uh, when we get back. Um, and with that, we will uh, move forward with our bills for today. Um, and uh, the first bill uh, is uh, my bill. Uh, and so I will uh, turn the gavel over to um, Vice Chair Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, would you like to move your bill? Uh, I would. I uh, move that House File 2109 be laid over for possible inclusion, should the chair deem it a worthy bill. <laughs> Great. And so why don't you go ahead and tell us about your bill? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vice Chair Agum. This is a, a very simple bill. Uh, it would be funding the installation of uh, solar on state-owned buildings. And uh, we've seen, I think, some real success stories from uh, solar in our state for uh, having, I think, triple benefits of creating jobs, of uh, reducing electric bills, uh, and of dealing with our, our climate challenges. And so I think that this is a real common sense way to try to help uh, move forward with some solar installations on some of our state state facilities to help reduce costs for some of our state owned and operated buildings. Um, and uh, I have uh, two testifiers, uh, uh, Chair Acom, if uh, you'd allow. Go ahead and introduce your testifiers. Uh, first, uh, we'll hear from Justin Fay with Fresh Energy. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair uh, and uh, Chair Long. Uh, and good morning, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Justin Fay. I'm the Director of Public Affairs at Fresh Energy. Uh, Fresh Energy is a nearly 30-year-old Minnesota-based nonpartisan nonprofit organization working to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Uh, and I'm here today with my colleague, uh, Isabel Brecker, who is gonna speak after me in just a minute. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you this morning in support of House File 2109, which proposes an appropriation from the Renewable Development Account to support the installation of solar on state buildings. Uh, we're, we're truly living through a solar revolution in Minnesota. Over the past decade, solar energy has emerged as a critical tool that offers a number of public benefits, reduced emissions, creation of local Minnesota jobs, and long-term savings on customer utility bills. Minnesota's solar market has exploded with now more than 1,500 megawatts of solar installed in our state. It has become clear that the market sees solar as a winning proposition worthy of investment. We think that Minnesota taxpayers deserve the benefits of solar as well, and that there is a lot of untapped potential for the state to reduce its own utility bills and the taxpayers' utility burden as a result. 
Of course, Minnesota has taken some steps already. In 2019, Governor Walls issued an executive order that set goals for Minnesota state agencies to reduce both emissions and energy consumption. And individual agencies have been pursuing solar and other renewable energy options where they can. For example, the Capitol Complex currently has four buildings with solar installed. But there's a lot more that could be done, and this bill would simply provide another tool in the proverbial toolbox uh, to allow state agencies to reduce their overhead costs. Uh, at this point, Mr. Chair, I'd like to, or Madam Chair, I'd like to hand this over to my uh, colleague, Isabel Ricker. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Um, Ms. Ricker, please go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Ms. Ricker. I apologize. I was oh. muted. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Madam Chair. To all of us. Thank you. Go <laughs> it ahead. It wouldn't be Friday without a technical difficulty. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Chair Long. My name is Isabel Ricker on behalf of Fresh Energy. Uh, Representative Long's bill would create a new pathway for our state agencies and the Minnesota taxpayers that fund them to more fully participate and realize the many benefits of solar energy, including and especially lower utility bills, which translates directly into lowering the cost of government operations. Minnesota taxpayers spent $39 million in 2019 on electricity bills for our state agencies buildings. And this number doesn't even include judicial or commission facilities. Solar power can help to reduce those costs over the long term. Costs for solar projects have come down more than 50% in the past decade. And um, I, I apologize, and have a very long life expectancy, typically 30 years or more and of course provide essentially free electricity once installed. Public buildings are often among the very best candidates for solar as well. They, have, they typically have large flat rooftops with little shading, which provides very good solar generation potential. And these buildings tend to have long ownership or tenancy periods, which makes it extremely likely the state would fully realize the financial benefits of solar investment. Public buildings often are also of older building stock and tend to have higher electricity bills. So solar can be quite beneficial for cost saving. And of course, as the energy storage market in Minnesota ramps up, public buildings that have added solar already will be well positioned to serve as resilience hubs in emergencies. Other states around the country have uh, figured this out already and innovative proposals for using solar to reduce public agency utility bills are emerging from many unexpected places. In Michigan, the state's Department of Natural Resources recently found that 15% of their entire utility bill was being spent operating their state-owned fisheries. Their solution was a new solar project to power the state's largest fishery with um, more solar projects expected to follow. And in the state of Maryland, the state maintains ongoing competitive grant programs for solar on public facilities. Um, which state agencies apply for and are competitively um, allocated funds for. And that program has been operating successfully for more than a decade. House File 2109 has the potential to save taxpayer dollars for many years to come while leading by example and reducing emissions. To top it off, more than 4,300 Minnesotans are already working in the solar industry, meaning that state investments in this space have strong potential to support Minnesota jobs at the same time. That's a win-win-win for Minnesota and Fresh Energy encourages the committee to include funding for solar on state buildings as part of a future committee bill. Thank you so much for your time. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ricker. Um, Representative Long, should we, do you have any comment or should we go to public testimony? A public testimony would be fine, thank you. Great, so um, we have one testifier that signed up, um, Brad, Braden Solom with Ideal Energy, yep. Mr. Solom. Uh, Chair Long, members of the committee, my name is, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Braden Solom. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Ideal Energies. Um, thank you for allowing me the time to briefly speak in support of House File 2109, the funding to support solar energy array installations on state-owned buildings. As you may know, our company, Ideal Energies, is the leading provider of on-site solar energy to Minnesota's cities, schools, and other public institutions with over 200 solar arrays currently in operation on these buildings alone. This bill would provide an important opportunity to provide a better financial return for solar on state-owned buildings. There is one issue, however, that I would like to bring to your attention that is currently preventing our company's participation in working with uh, state agencies. 
In 2018, our company was chosen as a contract holder to provide solar to state agencies and other public institutions through the Solar Possible Program. Our contract was extended and was due to expire at the end of 2019. While this contract was in place, we had repeated communication issues with the Department of, Inter uh, of Administration and directed them to only speak with our company through directed channels of communication, myself or our CEO, Chris Seihaus. The department failed to use these communication channels, resulting in our company being excluded from bidding opportunities within the program. In, in late 2019, when this contract expired, we did not receive communication that the bid would be reopened for new applicants under a separate contract number entirely due to the department again, communicating with our company through unapproved communications channels. In this case, it was a salesman at our company who was unaware of the importance of this issue. This ultimately led to our exclusion from the new contract entirely. <clears throat> when we spoke with the department regarding this issue, we were told that their staff member who had collected the contact information and handled the communications with vendors was no longer with the department. We have tried repeatedly to contact the department about rectifying this issue and, been and have been told that they do not intend to reopen the contract for up to five years and will keep the number of vendors limited until then. We are concerned that this issue may not be limited to our company and will cost the state the opportunity for a wide variety of competitive options for solar if and when this bill is passed. We've also provided a handout, a letter written on our behalf that details this issue some more if you'd like more information. There is a solution to this problem, and that would be to reopen the application process for the state contract to allow for more participation in this potential program. We appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of House File 219, and we are going to work with Chair Long on how to make this process more inclusive for all developers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solom. And with that, I will, I'm looking to see if we have any questions from members. Um, not seeing any at the moment. Um, Representative Long, any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Chair Acom. I, uh, do uh, just want to thank uh, Mr. Solon for his testimony and um, state that I'm committed to helping uh, work with the Department of Administration to uh, try to make sure that we've we've addressed those concerns and that um, we are uh, trying to make sure that uh, all uh, companies that are eligible and uh, meet the qualifications are are uh, able to uh, participate in state contracts. Um, I do see there's one hand, so maybe I'll wait on closing comments until uh, until Representative Swazinski gets to ask his question. Great, thanks. Why don't we um, turn it over to Representative Swazinski? Do you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick, quick couple quick questions. <clears throat> so during the process, how do you envision, um, so let's say this moves forward, who will own the recs that are created from this? Um, will the state own them? Will the utility own them? Will ratepayers own them? What do, you, what do you envision with this process? Representative Long? Uh, th that's a good question. I wonder if uh, maybe Mr. Solom could talk to how this has worked in some of their, their public projects. Sure. Yeah, so um, we use two programs typically when we work with public institutions in Excel territory individually. Uh, one is the solar rewards program. And on, in that case, that's for smaller uh, installations around 40 kilowatts AC. <clears throat> uh, under that program, the renewable energy credits go to Excel for 10 years. Um, and on larger scale solar, which we've been doing a lot more in the past couple of years where we cover buildings kind of go over 40 kilowatts AC, um, we use a program through Excel Energy called the PV Demand Credit Rider, which is just a, a kind of a way to help um, finance these projects. And under that case, the renewable energy credits are owned by uh, the customers themselves day one. So you, the state of Minnesota would own this under this situation. Is that what you're saying? Yep, for the larger scale solar. Okay. And then, um, you know, obviously, if you're producing your own, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. It's all right. Go ahead, Representative Swazinski. Sorry. I'll try to do this right. Um, you're good. And just, you're good. And just a another question would be uh, from the, uh, a finance uh, representative Long. Do you feel the, so if there is potential savings, we, you know, rate payers pay to, help put this up on roofs of state-owned buildings. Um, will the rate payers get a, a reimbursement for the money saved by the state? Because obviously if you know they're spending $39 million a year and you eliminate a lot of that cost, that'll be a savings to the bottom line to the state. Will they then return that money uh, back to whoever 
actually paid for it to either rate payers or to Excel customers or how, what, what is your vision with that? Representative Long. I uh, think for the question of Representative Wazinski. So this would reduce the electric bills for our state government as a whole, which would result in, in cost savings for the state government. And then it's up to all of us in the legislature what we do with those savings. Representative Swazinski, did you have any follow-up or any further questions? Not right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, Representative Long, would you like to close? Sure. I just I want to thank our, our testifiers for their support of this bill. And I think this is a, a really common sense way to try to make sure that we're uh, reducing costs for our, our state government, creating some good jobs. Uh, and we've set goals as a state about meeting climate targets and also the uh, Governor Walz's administration has set goals about meeting um, climate targets as an enterprise. And so this would help with both those outcomes and I'm uh, grateful for the support. And Representative Along, would you like to renew your motion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I, I renew my motion uh, that House File 2109 be laid over. And House File 2109 is laid over. With that, I will turn the gavel back to Chair Long. Thank you so much. Our uh, second bill on the agenda today is uh, Representative Bo's bill, House File 2234. Uh, Representative Bo, would you like to move your bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move House File 2234 to be laid over for inclusion. Representative Bo moves House File 2234 be laid over for possible inclusion. And I believe, Representative Bo, you have an author's amendment. I do, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually end up having two author's amendment, the A2, I would like to move to get this bill in the proper shape that we'd like it to be. Uh, Representative Bo moves the A2, and is your uh, oral amendment to the A2, or should we should we adopt the A2 first? Uh, we can adopt the A2 first. They are they are separate. Okay. Uh, Representative Bo moves the A2 to get the bill in the shape he would like. Any discussion to the A2? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The A2 is adopted. Uh, Representative Bo, would you care to speak to your oral amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the uh, author's oral amendment is really a technical one, and all it seeks to do is on line 2.14, delete the term natural resources and insert the term commerce. And that just gets us lined up with the responsibilities given to the commerce folks in line 1.18. Uh, Mr. Elef, are you tracking that for the oral amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, page two, line 14, Delete natural resources and insert commerce. Any any discussion to the oral amendment? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the oral amendment is adopted. Representative Bo, please tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you for considering House File 2234 this morning. I believe this is a good bill. If we hope to expand the use of EVs in our transportation sector, we will need to increase the availability of public charging stations. Uh, this bill will place charging stations where they need to be, in our hometowns, in our communities, both large and small. The money for this effort will be appropriated from the renewable development account. And so, like I say, this is a good bill and I'm excited about what it can do for us. Mr. Chair, I do have two individuals who would like to testify in support of House File 2234, if I may. Absolutely, Representative Bo, would you care to introduce your first testifier? Absolutely, yes. My first testifier will be Connor J. Anderson with ChargePoint. Uh, Mr. Anderson, welcome to the committee. And both would like to share their screen if, if they may. Absolutely. All right, hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, perfect, I always have to make sure with those technical difficulties. Uh, so first uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Connor Anderson. I am a inside sales representative for the Midwest with ChargePoint. Uh, we handle electric car charging stations for a wide variety of solutions, all the way down from home, municipalities, and fleets. And when I was first contacted by Representative Bo for this bill, uh, first, the excitement I had for it, uh, there has just not been enough done by the state yet to go and introduce the adoption of fleets. And this is really going to go and help expand in a great way for the state if adopted. So can everyone see this screen here? So uh, basically what I want to go and highlight right here is this is where Minnesota stands as far as the numbers for electric vehicles in your state. So you rank 21st in the United States for electric vehicles. Uh, 
as of right now, there are only roughly 27 DC fast stations, which are rapid charge stations to accommodate everyone in Minnesota. And in general, there is roughly just a couple hundred of level two stations, which are slower stations. Uh, many times you find that home and businesses, you'll accommodate that. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here today drive electric vehicles personally, but uh, just looking at this map here, uh, if you were willing to go and drive somewhere in the state and these were your only gas stations, would you feel comfortable getting to all areas of the state? Uh, this is something that I personally with my EV has had challenges with while driving cross country, just not being able to get to certain locations because of it. Uh, recently, the uh, MPCA has done a uh, grant to go and add EV in the EV charging stations throughout the city, even throughout the uh, state, and it went immediately. Uh, I cannot tell you how fast I had uh, businesses and towns reaching out to go and just add even level two stations, like in the fast kinds, to go and support uh, the EV drivers in the area. And in general, ChargePoint has already worked with a uh, large number of locations throughout Minnesota. And adding this bill will just go and increase uh, the amount of ability, in the amount of uh, times people can go and charge up, get EVs, and just skyrocket adoption. We've already seen 10% quarter over quarter increase in EVs. And with the amount of stations you have, it's not sustainable. Um, so with that, I'll stop the screen share. But uh, as you can see, if you continue this 10% trend for another couple of quarters, you'll have much more EV drivers than we'll be able to go and charge in at ports and will severely go and impact the adoption from the state. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Representative Bull, would you care to introduce your second testifier? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my second testifier is from the company EV Connect, and I have worked on this. So my second, um, my second testifier is Ram Mbati Pudi, and he would like to speak with us as well in support of 2234. Mr. Mbati Pudi, welcome to the committee. Thank you very much and uh, appreciate the opportunity to address the, uh, the committee. The, um, my, uh, my name is Ram Ambati Pudi and I'm a co-founder and uh, vice president of business development at EV Connect. EV Connect is a leading uh, electric vehicle software management platform. Oh, sorry, let me square my, share my screen. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay. EV Connect is a leading electric vehicle software management platform with over 8,000 charging station connectors under contract. We've been actively deploying and managing charging stations for over 10 years and have extensive experience with every customer segment, including government, public, workplace, destination, multi-unit dwellings, and fleet charging applications. This is a great time for the legislature to be considering this bill. Uh, consumers will soon have over 50 different options of electric vehicles, including passenger cars, SUVs, and pickup trucks. Major automakers such as GM have announced that 100% of their vehicles will be electric by 2035 or sooner. Minnesota currently has over 18,000 registered EVs, and that number will undoubtedly increase rapidly with more attractive and affordable vehicle choices. In, in addition to the vehicles themselves, deploying smart network charging infrastructure to support transportation electrification is critically important. Cities, states, utilities, and the federal government are implementing policies uh, and, and providing financial support to help reduce the cost to provide electrical charging infrastructure to support the growth of EVs. Recent studies have shown that lack of EV charging infrastructure is the number one barrier to EV adoption. This bill which will deploy public charging infrastructure at county facilities will directly help to alleviate range anxiety and provide access to public charging stations. Based on our experience, this will result in more EV adoption by county employees and the public at large. 
It is important to deploy charging stations in a manner that ensures high reliability and customer satisfaction. Uh, as a hardware neutral platform that utilizes open standards, uh, we believe that it creates a, a, a playing field to maximize customer choice. Our platform enables drivers to find and initiate charging sessions through the, our mobile app and allows facilities to manage their charging stations by setting access and pricing policies and get robust data reporting on station utilization. In closing, EV Connect strongly supports uh, HF2234 as a way to expand the public charging infrastructure at county facilities and increase the adoption of electric vehicles. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that uh, completes your testifiers, Representative Bull. So we'll go to member questions. Um, and first, we have uh, Representative Hornstein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bo. Um, I, I really appreciate this bill and the testifiers. I had a similar bill yesterday around uh, EV charging stations on uh, state highways uh, to um, enhance MnDOT's uh, capacity on that front. Of course, some charging stations were uh, acquired under the VW settlement. But uh, as you have pointed out, Representative Bo, and I think the testifiers, we have a long way to go. And um, I think every little bit counts. So covering these county buildings will be important. And uh, so I hope that both of our ideas here uh, for county buildings and state uh, uh, MnDOT infrastructure uh, can be advanced this year. And I just wanted to say thank you, Representative Bowen. I appreciate the bill. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, my question is for one of the testifiers. If my battery on my electric car is near zero, how long does it take to charge that battery up again to full capacity? Good question. Uh, Mr. Anderson, looks like you'd like to take that. Hi. So a lot of this is highly dependent on the actual electric car that you are using. Uh, the longest range ones being Tesla's currently. If you're using a DC station, the one that I highly recommend uh, this bill focus on, you'll go and see a full charge in around an hour and a half to two hours on even the uh, largest range EV. And for some of the smaller range EVs around the one to 200 uh, mile range, it could be as little as 30 minutes. Uh, yesterday, uh, when I was charging my car, there's a rapid charger up here. I was able to get from 50 miles to 243 in around 25 minutes. And uh, that was using a Tesla station, but uh, basically there are plenty of Tesla DC stations. This is to focus on everyone else and all the other EV drivers that are rapidly expanding. Uh, as the other testifier said, GM going fully electric in the next few years, uh, they are really going to go and start taking over, and that's where we need to focus. So less time than it might take you to go in the county office and get your passport done. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Representative Grunhagen, uh, any follow-up? Thank you. Bye. Okay. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you. And then this question is to Representative Bo. Would only counties in like Excel territory be eligible for this and then also obviously we've heard some bills um, as far as who is actually going to pay for the electricity um, is there going to be any connection to this that uh, the counties actually have to pay for the electricity or the employees if they're using it on their own and then is it a vision to just use county vehicles to plug in these things or is this open to the public um, how will that process work absolutely Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Swede, boy, there's a bunch of them there, so let's try to take them one by one, and I may have to come back for a prompt uh, for some of those questions if I miss it. But um, as far as uh, counties in the uh, Excel service area or not, you know, I, I thought about that, and, and my thought is solar panels up on the roof, that would make sense perhaps to do it only in areas that are served by Excel. But in this case, grandpa and grandma could be Excel customers but they're driving up north to see the grandkids. And so in that case, utilizing charging stations along the way could be serving XL customers, even if that particular charging infrastructure is not located in an XL service territory. So that's why it's going to be open to all 87 counties in the state of Minnesota. Uh, there was a question I believe about, about uh, who, would be, who would be paying for that. And, and as I recall, 
this effort is really going to allow the counties to allow to um, make sure that they are setting up to pay for the the uh, the person using utilizing the charging infrastructure would be paying uh, for that energy that is being uh, utilized and loaded in. Did I did I cover what you need? Representative yes, I, so I think Representative. what you're saying is, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think what you're saying is that the person actually plugging in would pay for it. So if the county is count, doing a county vehicle, they would. And then also, is there limitations on public and private space within the county? Um, so what I'm thinking of is, let's say you've got a, oftentimes counties have a kind of a workshop area where they're working on vehicles where maybe they just have some back office staff that are really allowed into maybe a gated area. And then you also have things of county courthouses, which are a very public area. Will there be differentiations with this or will they just be allowed to kind of put in whatever they want, wherever they want, or does there at least have to be a public access? Because as you said in your bill, that you know, if you got an XL customer traveling to visit their in-law someplace, that they'd be able to utilize this. Um, does that mean that you'll have a limitation that they can't be within gated areas for this charging? It has to be a public option. Representative Bull. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the goal here would be to have these located in a public portion of that county uh, government center parking lot. Now, likely during the day, this would be utilized by by the public customers coming in to utilize the government center, that sort of thing. And they would be paying for the energy through software that's that's part of that uh, charging infrastructure. Now at night, we may see the county fleet vehicles being charged, but that would mean that the county would be covering that cost, but it would, it would be out in a public area. And that's the goal. It will not be in a gated area, restricting access. Representative Swazinski, did you have further questions? And just in general, I think whether it's uh, just a general comment, kind of wondering aloud, um, you know, whether it's this bow bill or whether it was your blast bill for state buildings. Um, my guess is that the federal funds that will be coming to the state, I think we're getting two odd billion dollars could potentially be used for this rather than using Excel ratepayers money, I think. Well, I'll uh, speak to uh, at least my understanding of the, the federal funds. I've been uh, um, looking into those in the last week, and I, I do believe that the, the 2.6 billion has to be tied to uh, pandemic relief, uh, with the exception of broadband, which was explicitly carved out. I am I do know the federal government's talking about doing some uh, electric vehicle infrastructure build out, which I think is exciting. But um, but I do also know that we have a long way to go, as the testifiers have, have pointed out, in terms of getting the, the build out we need. A representative bill. Yes, no, I, I would concur with your thoughts as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't see uh, further questions. Representative Bowen, any closing remarks? No, absolutely. Mr. Chair, members, uh, I'd like to thank my testifiers for joining us today. Thank you for hearing 2234 and considering laying over for inclusion. I believe this is a good bill, which will provide public charging station access across all 87 counties. I was pleased also to see a letter of support in the packets from Fresh Energy for House File 2234. I noticed the other day a survey from Consumer Reports that found seven of 10 American adults with a valid driver's license are interested in pursuing purchasing a plug-in EV in the future, but charging options remain really a primary concern for those buyers. So by providing charging stations in our Minnesota government centers, we could take a giant step toward addressing those concerns. So I thank you for your consideration today. Thank you, Representative Bow. Representative Bow renews his motion that House File 2234 as amended be laid over and the bill is laid over. Thank you. Uh, next, we are hearing uh, Representative Liss Lagarde's bill uh, informationally. Uh, Representative Liss Lagarde, uh, would you care to talk about your bill? I sure would, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank you for um, setting aside this time. Uh, we've had this discussion uh, throughout amendments and uh, other conversations throughout the, the year so far, and I agree with so much that was already said. So um, this bill will take, if, when we, if we include it, this bill will take significant steps towards buying clean and buying fair in our state purchasing and establishing transparency for people. 
I do want to make it clear that I do respect the environment and I want to fight climate change while protecting and promoting the economy in Minnesota and the good jobs for our people. We, most of us agree with these goals. Unfortunately, in a global economy, other countries and their industries are not so committed to these goals. In China and Africa and other uh, uh, countries, minerals are extracted without stringent environmental rules that we have in Minnesota and the USA. Products are manufactured without regard for environmental consequences or fair labor standards. In the US, we long ago moved beyond those brutal extractive processes that hurt the environment and hurt people. Today, this bill, we are proposing that the state of Minnesota take some concrete steps in evaluating the environmental and labor costs of products being used and consumed by the state itself. Our goal should be clear, providing transparency so our citizens can compare the true environmental cost of producing, for example, iron ore, steel, rebar for domestic sources and factories compared to the environmental cost of producing them in unregulated factories in China and shipping them across the ocean. Education. We need to uh, make these consequences transparent. We are helping to educate our citizens on the wider issue of the economy and the environment. We strengthen the companies who have invested their capital to protect the environment. We reward the good players and punish the bad ones. Jobs. By renewing, by reviewing and scaling the mineral uh, minerals and the materials the state purchases, we will end the rewarding, uh, we will reward companies in Minnesota and workers in the US by promoting them and putting them in a much better position to be successful. I look forward to talking about this bills, this bill on the streets of the Iron Range where I can explain that we are in the state of Minnesota, we are valuing what we buy and we purchase in this state. I just wanna just tell people, everybody knows who I am. You know where my heart is. I wear it on my sleeve that I am so proud of the region that I come from. The men and women of labor, the companies working side by side, doing the right thing the right way. And if the state of Minnesota wants to mandate, which we are, we're moving into a green economy. You have a, a um, Cleveland Cliffs, an outstanding community partner in our region that is making steps. They're gonna be 25% reduction in environmental greenhouse gases. That is a commitment that these companies, clean steel, we as, a, we as a country, we as a nation, we as a state of Minnesota need to lead the way. And the, the conversations that we've had throughout this, uh, um, throughout this thing in the amendments, and you all know that I supported them because I believe in them. And this is a great step forward to have the conversation, bring this to light. The average person hears us debate, do amendments, can't do that amendment. The average person doesn't understand the true cost to do, doing things right. And if the state of Minnesota wants to lead, which we should, this is the bill and this is the conversation that we have to have moving forward. When, and when, you, when I live on the Iron Range and I see Cleveland Cliffs US Steel making these investments to do the right thing the right way and supported by labor, when I see labor and man management working together, you can't ask for more than that. And we have it right here in the state of Minnesota. So um, I have two testifiers um, gonna be speaking on behalf of this um, chair. I think uh, that Bree Helverson is going to walk through the bill. I will be totally upfront with everybody. Um, it is not as easy as that I would like. I wish I just could say, uh, made, uh, you know, buy it in Minnesota and buy it USA made, but it's not that simple. It's complicated. And if we don't have the conversation, we don't, we're not committed to be digging into this, then we're never going to get anywhere. And it starts with education. It starts with this conversation. So I would just ask, uh, Mr. Chair, if Bree could go through, explain the bill. And then I have, um, John Arbogast from the 
um, the steel workers to uh, also testify. Thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde. Uh, Ms. Halverson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Long and members of the committee. Um, I'm Bree Halverson, the Regional Program Manager for the Blue Green Alliance. Um, just to let you know, the Blue Green Alliance unites labor unions and environmental organizations to solve today's uh, environmental challenges in ways that create and maintain quality jobs and build a clean, thriving, equitable economy. I'm here today to testify in favor of Representative Liz Lagarde's bill, the Buy Clean and Buy Fair Minnesota Act, which is a way to guarantee, um, as he said, that products and materials are used for public projects like infrastructure improvements are the cleanest and most sustainable av available while supporting clean and domestic manufacturers. The bill would also take the first steps in ensuring that public dollars do not support um, worker exploitation at home or abroad. Uh, that uh, not only do we buy clean products, but ones that are fair to workers as well. Infrastructure spending um, from, uh, road, uh, from road building to clean and wastewater systems to public building and construction typically includes the cost of large quantities of steel um, and other materials. Producing these ma materials can create large quantities of climate and air pollution. So for this bill specifically, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things. First, the bill does um, uh, state the goals of incorporating low carbon construction phasing requirements that address greenhouse gas emissions from construction materials into government purchasing. And to understand that a little bit better, uh, the Carbon um, Leadership Forum uh, added a handout, which I think will help explain that um, a little bit better than I could. But it also creates a goal to collect data to set working condition standards of manufactured the manufactured process. Uh, but the smart choice that Representative Liz Lagarde made regarding this policy was to start a pilot program. Um, and that's important because the pilot program starts um, with a very specific uh, material scope um, that will help give us time to create a process to achieve the goals um, that Representative Liz Lagarde stated very eloquently um, within the bill uh, to support Minnesota industry and Minnesota workers. Um, by enacting buy clean policies, we can ensure that taxpayer dollars are being spent responsibly on materials that are manufactured in a cleaner, more efficient, environmentally friendly manner, reducing pollution and the negative health impacts that go along with it while supporting good Minnesota jobs and jobs across the nation. Thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde. Um, for this bill. Uh, thank you, Chair Long, um, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, the labor movement and environmental partners of the Blue Green, Blue Green Alliance strongly support the effort to buy clean when it comes to our state's infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halverson. Uh, uh, would you like to introduce your next testifier, Representative Lissagard? I sure would, Mr. Chair. This is uh, my good friend, uh, John Arbogast, uh, with the Steelworkers. Mr. Arbogast, welcome to the committee. Hi, thanks, Chair Long. Uh, members of the committee, uh, hello from the Iron Range. Don't you love Re Representative Lillard Passion? Oh, I'm tired already. Um, my name is John Arbogast. I'm the District 11 staff representative for the United Steelworkers, North America's largest industrial union. District 11 encompasses nine states, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming. What my job basically is, I'm in charge of the working with the unions and the company on the contracts, the basic labor agreements and the day, -day, -day operations of five of the six mines up here on the Iron Range. I'm here to speak in favor of Re Representative Lillard's Guard's bill, the Buy Clean and Buy Fair Act and urge committee members to support moving this bill forward. Buy clean levels of playing field for companies that are doing things the right way and incentivizes those that aren't making the grade on board if they wanna grow business up opportunity for their business. Many of these imported products and materials for our nation's infrastructure could be made here in the US by American workers instead of countries with lower environmental and health standards and higher emitting facilities. I think a lot of members on the committee know the struggles that the United Steel Workers go through year after year with these illegally subsidized countries that illegally dump foreign steel into this country 
and uh, we'd like to see that changed. Many manufacturers in Minnesota and the U.S. are cleaner than their global competitors. I think we all know that. And our members are ready to supply the materials and products we need to fix Minnesota and America's infrastructural systems. Taxpayers deserve to get the most bang for their buck, both in terms of using the most climate-friendly products and the ones that support good jobs here in the U.S. Transparency is key to ensuring that any bike clean policy functions as it's intended. Transpar transparency means taxpayers can be confident that their tax dollars are supporting companies that are doing things the right way to keep the environment and the workers safe. Thank you, Representative Willisgard and the co-sponsor of this bill for bringing it forward. The members of the United Steelworkers strongly support the effort of the buy clean when it comes to the state's infrastructure, and we're ready to help out in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arbogast. Uh, we're going to go next to member questions, and we'll begin with Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a, a big thank you to Representative Liz Lagarde. Um, you have, uh, and uh, the testifiers as well. Um, you know, I had uh, started some work on this with uh, Ms. Halverson and the Steelworkers a couple of years ago. And I, I think thanks to Representative Liz Lagarde and others, uh, I think this year uh, we have really moved this uh, issue forward. And uh, I appreciated Representative Liskegard your support of the study language that's going to uh, be I, I hopefully included in the omnibus. Uh, and um, and I think that this is the cutting edge. This is where we need to be headed. Uh, I think it's a win-win for uh, labor and uh, the climate. And and this is this you know such important work. And I can't thank you enough, Representative Liskegard. Uh, Mr. Uh, Arbogast, Ms. Halverson, uh, for your testimony and, and the work that you're doing every day on this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hornstein. Uh, Representative Stevenson. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, thank Representative Listlegard for bringing this bill. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, one Minnesota and bringing different uh, groups together, but look, uh, Representative Listlegard is actually doing it with this bill. And um, advancing several important uh, goals for our state and one piece of legislation supporting our working families and important industries in northeastern Minnesota, but also pursuing um, our, our need to ensure that we have uh, a good climate and good air and water uh, in Minnesota. So what an important piece of legislation. Thank you, Representative Whistlegard, for working so hard on it. Uh, we've been kind of previewing it all year long. And uh, it uh, uh, exceeds expectations when it finally uh, gets here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Stevenson. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Representative Lissagard, uh, I think it is a good bill to, to bet and have a discussion on. Uh, it has come up about uh, some of the elements in solar and wind uh, coming from overseas and foreign countries who have use slave labor and child labor even to uh, bring those elements over to America. So I do think uh, it's good to bet. I don't know if I'd support your bill or not because I'd have to take a look at it. This is the first time I've heard about it. But it, you know, according to the testimonies by Mr. Arbor and yourself, it sounds like you're Trump supporters. Make America great again. <laughs> Maybe you should vote that way. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Representative Grunhagen. Um, I don't see further hands, so I'll just add my my uh, comments that uh, of thanks for Representative Lagarde's hard work on this. This really is a visionary bill. Uh, it is taking our state to the next level of where we need to go to help support good labor standards, to help support good environmental standards, uh, and to help support companies like those Representative Lagarde mentioned, Cleveland Cliffs, that has set aggressive greenhouse gas goals themselves uh, to move forward. And and those are those are. Um, commitments that we want to help recognize as a state and support and value uh, with our public dollars. So I'm just very grateful for your work on this bill, Representative Lissagard, and, and wholeheartedly support it. Uh, Representative Lissagard, would you care to make any closing remarks to your bill? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all your help and your guidance. This, uh, this doesn't come easy. There is a lot of different moving parts, and like I said, I just wish I could say made in America, right? and uh, do everything here, but it's much more complicated than that. And it starts with gathering information and it starts little by little. And uh, I really wanna thank labor um, for um, standing up and wanting to do the right thing, but also to thank 
the companies for their commitment to. Um, on the iron range, everybody views that it's always management versus uh, the unions. It, it's not that way. Um, yes, they disagree, but they agree on this. And when you have business and labor and communities coming together with one voice, one vision to do the right thing the right way, that's where power comes from. And that's what makes our state and our nation great. So with that, um, thank you all for um, your support and uh, hopefully we can get this passed. Thank you, Representative Lizelgard. Uh, and with that, we will be moving to our fourth and final bill for today, which is House File 1486 with uh, Representative Sundin. So I will move that uh, House File 1486 be laid over for possible inclusion. Welcome Representative Sundin, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the motion. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, House File 1486 is a bill that is a game changer for Northern Minnesota. It provides a financial incentive for the construction of processing plants that will use only wood waste products like chips, dust, and bark, and turn them into wood energy pellets that will be exported around the world. This will be a value-added industry that will create good jobs, utilize waste products, and are either starting on fire, getting landfilled, or piled up all over northern Minnesota. Okay, tentatively, uh, sites in Grand Rapids and Bemidji uh, have been identified. The bill provides $25 per metric ton financial payment for the renew from the renewable development account. It is capped at two plants and sunsets after 10 years. As many of you know, the shutdown of uh, the energy plants in Benson and other locations that were authorized by the legislature then shut down prematurely by the legislature and Excel Energy has caused many problems with truck haulers, wood waste products and disruptions of the rural economy. This bill helped solve the problems caused by those premature shutdowns and is one reason why the RDA account makes sense. The plants will be built by union labor and will have an open card process for the workers once open. It is a win-win for our, the economy, for utilizing waste products, and studies show immensely less carbon in this process when compared to coal and or most other energy generators. There are tons and tons of product available, and detractors will say that uh, this will take away uh, residuals uh, from the market. Our market currently is flooded with wood fibers. We have piles of chips on fire, getting landfilled and not being used. This is not going to disrupt the market by uh, around International Falls one bit. I have with me today four presenters who will walk through the current market, how this bill will save an industry and answer questions you may have, starting with uh, Mr. Pete Aubie. Mr. Aubie, welcome to the committee. Uh, in the state forestry for decades. Thank you, Representative Sundin. Uh, Mr. Aubie. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank, thank you, Chairman Longer, members of the Climate and Energy Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present this exciting project for Minnesota and its important forest-based economy and our climate strategy. My name is Pete Aubie, and I sit on the board of Greater Bemidji, representing the Minnesota forestry sector, which I've worked for 40 years. Although retired, I still continue to serve the forestry community and support of ventures like this and all things forestry at the regional and state level. Slide one uh, shows our important forest industry has a very large statewide impact, uh, but has been in decline for a decade. We've lost mills in every sector and our forest and economy needs investments now and urgency is important. Slide two illustrates that Minnesota has lost residual markets from pulp and paper and energy closers at Laurentian Benson Verso and Hibbert, we've lost over 1.5 million cords or 4 million tons of wood demand in Minnesota. This is a 40% reduction. For those of you that might relate more to the agricultural economy, uh, imagine the impact on farmers and supporting economy of a 40% reduction in, in farm produce demand. Like the ethanol bill, which brought prosperity to farm country, yeah. this bill will bring resiliency to forest communities. The industrial pellet project diversifies and grows the forest economy by provided markets to beneficially utilize residuals that are the things that left over after processing. 
you will notice back Marty one more. <clears throat> you will notice uh, the bar on the far right of the chart showing the 200,000 tons utilized in a scale pellet plant. This bill would incent a res residual market at half of the one loss with the bench enclosure. Slide three illustrates that the typical sawmill residuals from our Minnesota's 225 sawmills. They include sawdust, chips, trims, saw shavings, and bark, all left over after processing lumber. Half of the wood that goes into the sawmill goes into lumber and the other half residuals. These residuals are costly. The DNR estimates that there are 850,000 tons of excess residuals produced annually in Minnesota. These residuals will make great pellets. Sawmills are important to a healthy forest and forest economy because sawmills pay the highest price for stumpage of any in industry sector. Those higher pr prices for logs benefit revenues to the public and state, public and private landowners, including school trusts, state and county land programs. And of course, the lumber products we all need and use stores sequester carbon for decades and even centuries for home and furniture lumber. Slide four shows how the expensive residuals typically ends up as only 10% of sawmill revenue streams. Residual revenues are declining with these declining markets. Shown on the right, we have lost typical markets. For some mills, residual revenues are down 40%. For others, they have gone away, taking sawmills with them. Minnesota has lost many sawmills over the decade. Albeit many of, of them are small, all are important to our economy and forests. As shown on the right, we only have one paper mill left using sawmill residuals. That mill was in, in opposition to our project last year and are in opposite, opposition to, the, to our project this year. Even though the Versal paper mill is sadly closed and made another 160,000 cords or 350,000 tons of wood available to the market every year. Because of this tragic loss of markets, we have House File 1260, the Timber Relief Bill proposed to help loggers extend, refund, or emit spruce and fir harvest on state timber sales. And county and state timber programs have been taking a substantial hit also by this sad event. Yet we are led to believe that timber availability is a threat to this paper mill and in sending a new investment using ex excess residuals to create new jobs and new revenue streams for the broader forest industry is a bad idea. I hope you take time to watch the four minute North Star pellet video and it will you will see further uh, and hear why this bill is important from testimonials from mill owners, environmentalists, private and public landowners, including your state forest trust administrator and your state forestry director who support the project and the benefits to, this, to the state. Loggers, county de land departments, private landowners, economic development organizations across the state have written letters in support of this project. Why? Because this project will turn the serious problem and threat of mill and forest residuals into an opportunity and a benefit for Minnesota's forest economy. It makes sense, economic sense, forest health sense, and climate sense. Pellets represent an emerging and growing market on a global scale that helps address the challenge of climate change by reducing carbon emissions by substituting renewable and sustainable wood for higher emission gas and coal. The fact that North Star pellets are made from wood residuals after processing maximizes this environmental benefit. Other wood dependent countries like Canada have incented to invest in the pellet industry to save its sawmill industry and forests after the decline in pulp and paper mills in their economy. Diversification of our industry is an important benefit to the future of Minnesota's forests. Lastly, with over 6 million acres of the 17 million acres of Minnesota forest and county and state land trust, our legislature and governor control more forest acreage than any other state other than Alaska. Making an investment in the industry with this project will benefit those assets 
with both revenues and improved management and health. Thank you for consideration of the bill. I'll defer to Matt Ryla. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Sandine, would you care to introduce your next testifier? Mr. Uh, Matt Ryla, will you introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony? Uh, Mr. Sure, Ryla, thank you. on the committee. Sure, thank you, uh, Chairman Long and committee for being here today. I'm Matt Ryla of Ryla Companies. We are a fourth generation forest products company operating at Tats County for the last 98 years. The collapse of the residual market in Minnesota has put our forests and sawmills in peril. Ryla Companies has been shipping wood products to International Falls since 1920. We are currently shipping our balsam chips right past PCA to Dryden, Ontario, 223 miles just to a temporary market. Just to, uh, in, in the 1990s, we were shipping upwards of 20,000 cords annually to then Boise and saw that drop to zero in 2019. That coupled with the closures in Benson, Laurentian, Minnesota Powers Energy, uh, Rapids Energy Center, and soon to close Hibbard Station in Duluth, we are drowning in mountains of wood chips, sawdust, and bark. These piles are getting so large that they are on fire from combustion as we speak. Uh, this bill is absolutely critical for our forests, our mills, our communities, and we desperately need your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sundin, would you care to introduce your next testifier? Uh, let's see who's, who's up next then. I don't. Uh, I believe it's uh, Mr. Heng Hengel. Uh, Mr. Hengel, no, Dave Hengel, please. Part. Mr. Goulet, it looks like. Goulet? Yep. Um, hi guys, my name is Marty Goulet. I'm in International Falls, Minnesota. We have a third generation family business up here in construction and logging. Um, I'm also the founder of a company called Highland Pellets. Here's a picture of our uh, Highlands plant down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It's the third largest pellet plant in North America. On the left side, you'll see one of these lines. This is what we're using as, as Representative Sundin said, using Union Labor plan to build one of these lines in Grand Rapids and a smaller version of these in, in Bemidji. Um, one of the differences, and it's been mentioned, is we would not need a wood yard. We would be using 100% residual wood. Uh, this plant in Arkansas sends all of its pellets to the UK to be used by a, a, a electric generating plant there. And it, using their calculator, it's about an 89 to 90% reduction in carbon footprint. Obviously, the, the plant in Minnesota would be even exponentially better from a carbon standpoint. I've also included uh, an overview of the global demand. Global demand is booming. It's growing at two and a half million tons a year. That's, that's 25 plants like what we're talking about building. This is what's driving this is governments committing to their uh, carbon footprint reduction and using pellets instead of coal. Current demand is coming from Asia. So the plant we would build in, in Minnesota would be sending its pellets to Japan, which is a 20 year incentive, which means that we would, we would have an investment grade offtake agreement with a, a a Japanese counterparty, which ensures we would stay in business for at least 20 years. Like Pete mentioned, this is not something new. This is already being done. This is how Canada has, has addressed its issue with a declining paper industry. What this chart shows is all the plants in North America. The blue one is our plant, but these ones here, these are all exactly what we're talking about building wood pellet plants located right next to, to sawmills. And Canada has built up all the infrastructure to support this industry and, and our, our project would piggyback on what they've already built out. I've also included some, some financial overview. While this is a very stable 20 year business, it also needs an incentive from the state to be a viable project. There is precedent out there with other incentives like mentioned the ethanol incentive. There's an existing incentive, the advanced biofuel production incentive that, that businesses within our industry are already accessing. If we were to use the calculation in this incentive, it would be $38 a ton 
which is $13 a ton more than what we've, we've asked for in ours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my testimony. I would like to hand it over to Mr. Hengel. All right, uh, Mr. Hengel, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to voice my support for House File 1486. I'm Dave Hengel. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Bemidji Development. For economic development projects that require public investment, we have to address what's called the but-for test in which we ask the question, is this incentive necessary? Because of the logistical challenges of getting the pellets from here to port, it's clear that this project will not happen but for uh, this incentive. In fact, it's projects like this that have such broad-based public benefit that incentives were intended. I'm aware that you're gonna receive opposition to this legislation due to the incentive. Sadly, it's my understanding that the same company opposing the legislation has accepted subsidies in the form of tax credits many, many times larger than what we proposed here. I encourage you to consider two key points. First, these are shovel-ready sites. In other words, they're ready to go. Second, this is a pay-for-performance incentive only. The company has to deliver the public benefit before re receiving a penny of the incentive. Overall, the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development has estimated this legislation will provide the state of Minnesota a 20 to one return on investment. The legislation is good for the environment, it's good for landowners, which in Minnesota primarily is our state, counties, and school trust properties, and it's good for the industry. That's why you see over 20 counties, development organizations, and companies have submitted letters of support for the legislation to you. House file 1486 is simply good for Minnesota. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we have public testifiers signed up, so we'll turn to them before uh, member questions. Uh, first, we will hear from Lori Lyman. Welcome to the committee. If you could uh, unmute yourself, Ms. Lyman. Thank you, Chair Long and the committee members for having us today. I'm Lori Lyman, Public Affairs Manager at the PCA, Boise Mill and International Falls. As an integral member of Minnesota's forest products industry for over 110 years, PCA strongly opposes House File 1486. PCA employees proudly manufacture America's top selling brands of office and recycled paper. We have a solid business plan and solid employees that execute it. The only request of legislators is to allow us to compete on a level playing field to safeguard the mill, employees, and their families and the future of our community. As is, House File 1486 will create an unfair competitive advantage unless given to the entire industry. Ongoing incentives that offset operating costs benefit pellet facilities in direct competition with existing facilities for raw material, both ground wood and quality consistent wood mill residuals. The 45 pellet plant jobs will cost Xcel Energy ratepayers $83,000 per job a year or $833,000 per job over 10 years and will not advance renewable energy in the Excel service area or even in the United States. Our paper market was severely impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. We adapted to a decline in the market and other challenges caused by the pandemic, but House File 1486 will create an unfair competitive advantage that will be difficult to overcome. Competition makes our industry stronger and we all want that, but not when one company has a very clear advantage. PCA agrees we need additional markets for forest resources. In our experience in the past, um, incentives have been in the form of about a 3.78% forgivable loan. So the, the pellet plant would qualify for a one-time modest forgivable loan for startups. We would support that, but House File 1486 gives them 42% of their total investment. We all have logistic concerns when it comes to doing business in Minnesota. We ship all over the country as well, but as a company, we, um, 
We take care of our costs through efficiencies and improvements and capital investments. And we don't come and ask for taxpayer dollars. Our concern is the ongoing 37 and a half million that will offset their day-to-day -day costs for 10 years when we're not given the same consideration. And this is also in addition to any advanced biofuel production um, incentives that they may be eligible for, IRRB money, and other types of money. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, our next public testifier is Tim Wagner. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Chairman Long uh, and committee members. My name is Tim Wagner and I am a 30 year employee at Packaging Corporation of America. And I'm a member of the United Steelworkers Local 159. At our facility, we produce premium copy paper. I'd like to be clear on my position. I'm not opposed to new forest products facilities. However, I am opposed to HR 1486, government operating incentives in order to fund new forest product facilities. <clears throat> I have seen firsthand the effects on forest products industry from government incentives. In 2013, we experienced a major curtailment of operations at PCAI Falls, the shutdown of three paper machines and job loss in the hundreds due to foreign government incentives. Government incentives tip the competitive scales and create un even playing field for business. Governments should not pick winners and losers. <clears throat> for us at PCAI Falls with a razor thin margin to remain a low cost producer in a globally competitive market, Bill HR 1486 could have dev devastating consequences including job loss at our facility. PCAI Falls has 600 employees with 490 union employees, which in turn spin off many other jobs within the community. The occupations at PCA hold good union compensation and benefits, which are family and community supporting. These jobs are an important tax base for the city and county. For the state government to put these good paying generational jobs at risk would be a disservice to the hardworking union women and men of PCA. I ask you Chairman Long and the committee to oppose House File 1486. Thank you. Thank you. And our final public testifier is Mr. Bob Ryan. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairman Long, members of the committee. My name is Bob Ryan, and I'm the Rapid Response Coordinator for the United Steelworkers District 11. Part of my job is working on legislative issues in the nine states that we represent in our district. But before coming on staff 10 years ago, I worked for 30 years at the West Rock Paper Mill in St. Paul, so I do understand the paper industry very well. I understand competition, and competition's good. But when all parties are not on the same playing field, it's unfair. And we've lost over 350,000 jobs in the paper industry in the last decade due to unfair trade and unfair advantages that governments in other countries give to other paper companies. The, the part of this bill that is disturbing is that we would use taxpayer money or RDA money, however you want to name it, to create a wood pellet to be sent to Southeast Asia or Japan, wherever, for their energy production. And we file, we have to file trade cases constantly against cheap foreign paper imports that put our paper mills at risk and closure. That's why we oppose this bill. We understand we need more players in the, in the wood industry and we would welcome more industries uh, into the state of Minnesota. I think a better use of any funding from any pot of money would be to help to try and restart the Verso mill in Duluth and employ up to 200 uh, hardworking people in a very well-paid atmosphere. And that, uh, that is why I oppose this legislation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, now we'll turn to member questions. And first we'll begin with Representative Igo. Thank you, Chair Long. And mine isn't so much of a question. I just, I wanna thank Representative Sundin for carrying this bill. Um, this bill is incredibly important to our Northland um, in, in the future of our timber industry. And thank you to the testifiers. Uh, Matt, good to see you, a uh, friend of mine from district. Um, you know, it's just, not only does this bill provide good paying jobs, but it's gonna help us use that waste material like you heard. Um, you know, Itasca County, uh, Beltrami County, all these other counties, Cass County I, that I represent, 
we're facing economic decline. We need to start diversifying and have industries like this to start picking up the pieces so that we can have a Northland that continues to thrive. That's why I ran for office. That's why I'm down here. So thank you again to Representative Sundin. Thank you to the testifiers. And I really hope members that we can, we can all come to terms on this bill and pass this bill because um, it, it really is needed for our Northland communities and our Northland economy. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Igo. Representative Swazinski. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Maybe. Sorry, oh. sorry Mr. Chair. I just had some, con I, everything just went blank there for a second on my end. Um, just a quick question to the testifiers. Um, you know, just on average, you know, we heard that there's some groups that are against this potential project moving forward. Um, you know, we're, they're talking, it puts an unfair advantage and I understand that concern, um, you know, what other uh, funding mechanism have been utilized? You know, is there going to be like IRRB money used with this as well, this program? And they just had a, a labor question. Um, it was mentioned in the-, the, the uh, Maybe we'll begin. Why don't we begin with your first question, Representative? Yeah, Susan. thank you. And we'll come back to you. Uh, Representative Sundin, would you like to begin? Well, uh, restate that question, please. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I just was wondering what other funds will be used uh, with this this project. I don't have that funding package uh, in front of me. I, I believe uh, Mr. Goulet could answer that best. Mr. Goulet. Uh, yes. Um, nothing has been confirmed yet. We've so I triple R B is the, the Grand Rapids site is in the IRRB. We've been in discussions with them. Um, there's been some discussions in, in some low interest uh, loans, but uh, nothing as of yet. Um, the city of Grand Rapids has looked at a TIF and um, um, we've, we've explored some, some federal grants. So those are the other things we've been looking at. Nothing finalized at this point. Representative Swazinski. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then um, just a question kind of uh, to the industry folks, you know, a two-part question. One, sounds like some industry folks are concerned about the subsidy portion of it and unfair competition, um, you know, and I wanted to ask if those entities had ever received any subsidies or lends through the IRRB or forgivable grants or anything like that. And then two, just from a capacity, standpoint and carrying um, obviously we support logging it's a wonderful industry um, will there be a shortage of pellets or, I mean as far as the the slash or whatever is used for to the manufacture of these between the different industries um, and how will that play out will we raise the cost and you know be less com competitive or how will that possibly work is that a question for Ms. Lyman yeah, it could be Ms. Lyman, but then just in general, like if I'm not sure if anyone's with the DNR on the call, that could maybe speak to that. I don't believe so. Uh, Ms. Lyman. Okay, um, we did. We did a major build, um, putting in the largest, fastest paper machine at the time um, in the late 80s. And we invested $535 million. And for that, we received a for forgivable loan of 3.7 percent. Um, if that same formula was applied to the pellet plant of their 90 million investment, it would come to about 3.4, 3.5 million in a forgivable loan. And again, we are not against that. And um, the, the pellet proposal says 100% residual, but there are RECI studies out there that have studied the impact of pellet plants down south. And um, one, I just pulled one from 2015, which was relatively early in the pellet plant process. And they found that 76% of the feedstock used to make pellets um, export from the US to the south was accounted for by pulpwood. So logging pulpwood. And only 24% was accounted for from forest biomass and mill residuals. 
So that's where the concern comes from. We are going to be competing for the same wood, whether it's wood mill residuals or round wood. Representative Swazinski, did you have a follow up? And, and just a, a third question. It was stated um, in the testimony that this grant would be about 80 some thousand dollars per job per year. Is that a real number or is that just talk? Did you want to direct that in a particular direction, Representative Swazinski? Uh, whoever said it, I, I don't remember who had said that. that. that, uh, that was, yeah, that was me. It was based on the 45 jobs that they're going to create and the $37.5 million that they're going to get from um, taxpayers or rate payers over the 10 years. Mr. Goulet, looks like you wanted to chime in. Um, I, I could address a couple things that, that have come up. So first, the the 45 jobs is for each plant. There's And those are direct jobs. There's another 250 indirect and direct jobs that are, are created. Um, so so that, that number is quite um, grossly over um, estimated. When we talk about the, and, and I, when I showed you the picture of the plant down in Arkansas, I wanted to point out that wood yard and how we would not be put, even putting one of those in, in Northern Minnesota. They have quite a different market down there. And, and yes, that, that market uses pulp wood, but pulp wood down there is different. It's, it's almost like a big farm. Uh, trees are growing and, and every, 10 to 15 years, they need to go in and do what they call first thinnings. And there was no market for first thinnings down there. And, and the health of the forest was decaying because people weren't incented to go in. And, you know, it's like a garden where you go in and you take out and leave some more rooms for the other ones to grow bigger. And, and so it, it's quite a different m market down there. Their forest grows faster. They've, they're, they've re-harvested them for decades. Um, it is quite an apples and oranges comparison. Our comparison to what they're doing in Canada is much more um, comparable. Uh, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, my question, I got a couple questions too. First one is to Representative Sundin. Uh, Representative Sundin, I find this very interesting. I know Northern Minnesota is uh, very hurting as far as good jobs and uh, industry is concerned. So I appreciate your uh, desire and Representative Eagle's or Eagle, uh desire to see something happen up there. But I also have a lot of concern about the the uh, things brought up by the testifiers who are opposing this, and uh, you know, like the thirty-seven million for ten years or whatever. Do you think you can bring peace in the valley between these groups uh, on this bill? Uh, not to not today, but over the over the next uh, month or so, so that we can get a compromise that comes out of this? Representative Sundin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Gr Grunhagen. There's always room for uh, negotiations here too. Uh, I think there's uh, some things that we should uh, talk about uh, in, in relationship to uh, making some peace in the Valley. You know, some of my union brothers uh, on the call here today uh, uh, have some consternation about the bill, but, uh, I think they're missing uh, an opportunity for organizing. If you have two plants with 45 people each, uh, that's an opportunity to grow their unions and uh, and, and gain membership. So uh, I, I, don't, I think they're uh, looking a little bit too narrow, narrowly at this whole issue. So uh, I, yes, I think there is. And, and then I think that we should bring some more clarity to the, uh, the uh, financial uh, competition, let's say, or, uh, stories that we've heard uh, about uh, the plant up in International Falls. And uh, I believe it was eight, uh, 87 or 89 uh, when the economy was tanking pretty bad and uh, they wanted to build that uh, uh, new machine up there, which was great. Uh, uh, it was a great thought anyway, uh, to going in, but uh, they, they got a sales tax break on that uh, uh, machine. It was a substantial uh, amount of money there uh, uh, for the uh, for that mill, and then uh, uh, you know they've uh, we've we've subsidized the loggers' roads up there so they can extract uh, pulp pulpwood and supply that mill. So there's plenty of uh, 
uh, public support for what goes on up there. And uh, we should just uh, be aware of the whole package. Looks like Mr. Abi, uh, very briefly, because we, we are running short on time. Yes, I, I just want to point out, I've been part of this industry for 40 years and there are incentives, you know, most businesses take incentives and credits and use them and we use them to attract businesses and we have the, the bio incentive program that pulp mills and sawmills are taking advantage of to make investments and these are good things. Yeah. We have so much wood in this state and we need more demand and, and you know, I, I just point you know, there there were very large cellulosic fuel incentives paid out in the hundreds of millions uh, to pulp mills, right? Not to sawmills, not to others. So to to say that you know there's un, unlevel playing fields uh, from time to time these happen, but the uh, you know what we're talking about here is helping helping an industry helping an economy in Northern Minnesota grow rather than decline. And yeah. the threat to, to fiber costs from this project is not there. So Representative Grunhagen, if you could, um, if you have one more question, if it could be brief so we can have time to get to Representative Stevenson. Yeah, real quick. Um, yeah, I just hope that uh, Representative Sundin can work things out between the two groups uh, because I do think the concerns expressed by the testifiers are, uh, uh, carry some validity and I think there needs to be a little bit more compromise through this process. But anyway, with Mr. Goulet, we have a quick question. Are the uh, wood pellet plants in Canada, do they need ongoing subsidies or are they operating profitably up there? Mr. Goulet, briefly. The, the Canadian government has helped those out tremendously in lots of different ways. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Representative, <laughs> Representative Stevenson. Yeah, uh, well, thanks to uh, Representative Sundin for bringing this proposal forward. It's it's uh, an interesting one on a lot of different levels. Uh, I'm I'm just kind of curious. I, I was struck by the comments about the use of residuals here, uh, and uh, to to one of the the testifiers, um, can you give us? Is there some basis, you know, for for the idea that that we can use 100% residuals for this and and not uh, into harvesting, uh, wood. And, uh, cause I mean, that seems to be an object of a lot of consternation here. And I'm just wondering where, is there some evidence or some data that we can look at to see that, that it actually will be all residuals? Representative Sundin, or would you like to direct that in a particular way? That's uh, specified in the bill. Ah, it's in the, okay. Mr. Represent Chair. Chair. Representative Stevenson. Uh, it's good to good to know that that's in the bill. Uh, that seems pretty important. Uh, the other thing that I I just I did uh, we haven't talked about that's probably worth thinking a lot about is, you know, historic. It's it's uh, our our friend Representative Mahoney isn't on the committee uh, any longer, but uh, you know he he and he and I are our friends, and I feel like I would be doing him a disservice if I didn't point out that that this I think is outside the XL service territory, and and so um, uh, if he were here, he'd be uh, yelling about that. Uh, thank you, Representative Stevenson, for channeling some uh, Representative Mahoney. <laughs> uh, I see no further questions. Representative Sundin, would you care to make uh, closing remarks to your bill? I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to touch on a few things, we've, we've gone through the finances uh, there. And just a reminder on that, there's not a penny of state money uh, being spent until there's a production, okay? Uh, that, that going in. Uh, we, I'm sorry that we didn't get to hear from the DNR. They could tell you about the glut of uh, wood in uh, Minnesota right now. Not that that affects the residual usage. Uh, this is just another great option for clean energy, you know, and uh, and it's we can we can take this uh, program uh, globally here. So you know we're we're exporting good product, creating good jobs, and uh, we're using the other half of the tree is what it is. So uh, remind uh, remind uh, everyone that uh, uh, we're not uh, cutting down any more uh, forest uh, for this uh, uh, particular uh, effort here. So, and uh, to my union brothers uh, there, just uh, reminding you if uh, this is an organizing uh, opportunity to expand your membership and uh, create good paying jobs in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin renews his motion and House File 1486 is laid over. Uh, members, we are at time. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful holiday uh, break and we will be back 
uh, busy to work when we return. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank Happy you.